My name is Greg Peterson. I am the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center, a center which is a little more than five years old, designed to advance the legacy of Justice Robert H. Jackson. I won't go through my normal 30-minute pitch because I assume all of you have got this and read it. And I appreciate that fact. We're here for an extraordinary afternoon with an extraordinary man concerning an extraordinary story. You talk about one degree of separation, this is it. The gentleman who I'll be introducing in a few minutes had a chance to interview an individual who was as close as anyone was to Adolf Hitler. But before we get to that portion of our program, let me go through a few housekeeping matters. First of all, fire exits. I think Raleigh may have mentioned them, but let me just underscore them. Up there to the top right for those folks, hopefully this is an exercise in futility, but that's up there, the fire exit here, and a fire exit to my left. This event would not happen without the benefit of some really wonderful community sponsors. And I want to pause for a second, and then when I, after I recognize all of them, if we could give them a joint applause for making this happen. Windstream, formerly Altel, and I'd like to introduce James Foster and Ann Mason for really making this happen. The folks at Axiom Office Imaging, Mark and Megan Olson, many thanks. Eileen Starr, thank you very much. Elegant Edibles Catering with Vicki McGraw and Ginny Bremer. Folks, thank you. Faulkner Electronics, Roger and Janine Hall, thank you very much. Lakewood Apothecary, the new show in Lakewood, and it's, it's wonderful. Uh, Maureen Ravenio is here, and, for, and with Jim Ravenio, thank you very much. Lakewood Furniture Galleries, Carol Vandermullen, Carolyn, thank you very much. And the folks at the Village Casino. The sum total of all of this is what's making this possible to have a man of the stature of Phil Donahue today. For them, let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> making sure that Phil Donahue got here on time and making sure that it would all run smoothly are three of his bodyguards also known as Ted Wolf, George O'Donnell, and Jerry Smith. All three of these, by the way, right here, if you guys want to stand and recognize, stand up and be recognized. <laughs> the background is that they all, three of them, together with Phil Donahue, were in the Notre Dame class of 1957. They're part of a group of 10 classmates which get together two or three times a year to keep in close contact, enjoy each other's company, and we're thrilled that you found Chautauqua County during August to have your latest reunion so that we at the same time could take advantage of your good friend Phil Donahue. We thank you very much, and Nancy, thank you very much for making sure Ted gets here on time, you know. <laughs> also, this facility, which is air-conditioned, thank you, Raleigh Kidder, and thank you to several others who financed this and made it possible. But this is the first event in our air-conditioned facility. And to the contractors and to Raleigh and all this, the Bill Parment, Kathy Young, and Senator Schumer, we say thank you very much. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't pause and reflect on the people who are really the, the wind underneath the wings of this Jackson Center. The, the Carol Drakes, the Raleigh Kidders, the Rich Fishers, Becky Robbins, all the docents who were meeting and greeting you, uh, thank you very much for making this all happen. <clears throat> I know you're waiting for the next thing, which is a surprise. A surprise and will probably terminate my friendship with him. However, it is today. It is today is a special birthday for one person who you know is Mark Russell. Mark's in the crowd today, so if we could all sing happy birthday to Mark. Happy birthday to you. Happy 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mark. Happy birthday to you. That was nice, but the outcomes were a little weak. <laughs> The order of the day will be soon I'll be introducing Phil Donahue. At that time, we'll be spending some conversation on that interview which I talked to you about, which is the real connect here to the Robert Jackson Center, his interview with Albert Speer. After that, we will have a chance to talk to Phil Donahue about Phil Donahue, which I assume is why a lot of you are here. Within your booklets is a three by five card and if you have a question anytime hopefully not as we get to that portion of the biography pass it along this would be to your right and if there's nobody there to get it then just leave it on a step because somebody will be there to pick it up with the idea that once we get to that portion of the Phil Donahue biography we're going to do a little Chautauqua style Q&A, and then at the end we'll just wrap it up. Also, hopefully everybody's had a chance to sort of sign in. Uh, we got a clipboard floating around, and just uh, we want to make sure that we know who everybody who's here, and we thank you all for coming. How did Phil Donahue get here? It's an interesting, serendipitous story, which most activities here at the Jackson Center seem to arise. I don't know why, but I was typing in Google under Albert Speer. Why, I guess, is because his picture is right there as one of the 21 defendants at the Nuremberg trial. There seems to be an ongoing curiosity of who were those people, what were they like, were they just normal human beings, because often they were portrayed as members of the Nazi party and maybe monsters, but behind it is probably an individual. So there's always this curiosity that we've had over the last five years when we've had anybody who's had a relationship. What was Gehring like? What was Hess like? What was Speer like? Well, a little bit of that, so I was doing some Google search. And all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, there's a link. It says Donahue interview. Donahue interview. Come on, I don't connect this at all. Click. Next thing you know, there's the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. And somebody is interviewing Phil Donahue about his illustrious career and he talks about some of his highlights and one of his highlights was an October 30th 1975 interview with Albert Speer. Connect. Now my mind starts racing and I think wouldn't it be great to interview Phil Donahue about his interview with Albert Speer. Enter Ann Cole. Poor Ann Cole is happens to be a docent at the Jackson Center the next day when I'm doing this P.T. Barnum piece. Can you believe this? I saw this, blah, blah, blah. And do you suppose, wonder if Phil Donahue is possibly coming here this summer because he occasionally makes visits with his friends from Notre Dame. Uh, and wouldn't it be great if we could put all this together with an initial idea of just interviewing him by myself. Uh, next thing you know, uh, Ann said she'd got a hold of Ted Wolf. And I get a phone call. Hi, this is Phil Donahue. I understand you're interested in interviewing me. I said, absolutely. And now my mind's racing because he wants to talk about the possibility of doing an interview here, when, how, where, and I've got to, things got to happen very quickly. Bottom line, the result is today. The last words were Phil Donahue's, which simply said, show me the mark, and I'll be happy to be there. And boy, I tell you, it, it, it's just phenomenal. So that was the setup. We're going to learn about Phil Donahue, obviously, a lot during the Q&A, but as a quick reminder, let me give you a little overview of Phil Donahue. Phil was born in Cleveland in 1935, educated at Notre Dame, and graduated, as I mentioned, in 1957. He began his career in 1957 at WKYW-TV and AM in Cleveland, went to WHIO-TV, where his interview with Jimmy Hoffa and Billy Saul Estes, for those remember those two individuals, were picked up by CBS. And in fact, Walter Cronkite actually reacted very favorably to his interview with Billy Saul Estes. 
1967, this was uh, in Dayton, by the way, he was, his show was considered a radical and scintillating addition to the daytime scene. As we know, from 1969 to 1996, he was nationally syndicated. He won 20 daytime Emmys, numerous other awards, and on the 25th anniversary of his show, Shirley Povich said, Phil Donahue was the granddaddy of us all, and he birthed us well. The man, Phil Donahue, was widely credited with inventing talk show platform. And on behalf of the Robert H. Jackson Center, I am thrilled to welcome Phil Donahue to our stage. Phil? On October 30, 1975, the country saw the airing of a Donahue special, a conversation with Albert Speer. It was a two-part segment, and it was somewhat novel. Novel because here was an individual who was an intimate of Adolf Hitler. Novel because Phil Donahue was able to access him. And for those who might not recall, who was Albert Speer? A quick bio. He authored two books called Inside the Third Reich and Spandau, The Secret Diaries. Albert Speer was Hitler's personal architect, confidant, and protege, the Reich Minister for Armaments and War Production, and the second most powerful man in Nazi Germany at the end of World War II. Speer was also a, a defendant at the Nuremberg trial, along with 21 other top Nazi Nuremberg defendants. And it's worth noting that the actual cross-examination of Albert Speer was done by Robert Jackson, and that uh, uh, it was Jackson who paid very close attention to Albert Speer as the, uh, the trial unfolded. Ultimately, he was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, served it in Spandau with six other defendants, and then was released in 1966. Less than 10 years later, our guest, Phil Donahue, had a chance to interview him in Heidelberg. This time, I'd like to show a brief introduction of what occurred back on October 30th, 1975. Last August, I traveled to Heidelberg, Germany to talk with 70-year-old ex-Nazi minister Albert Speer. In part one of this unique interview, Speer talks about Hitler's final hours before committing suicide, Hitler's mistress, Eva Braun, and analyzes how anti-Semitism developed among the Germans, and much more in an exclusive Donahue special report, Albert Speer, Eyewitness to Hitler, part one, on my next show. Join us. This is Phil Donahue. Not long ago, one of the chief centers of the civilized world became a torture chamber for millions of people. Not ancient history, not medieval history. It happened in my lifetime. The Nazi state in Germany in the 30s and 40s is the subject of continuous debate and analysis. 30 years after the death of Adolf Hitler and the trial of 21 Nazis at Nuremberg, only one of Hitler's high command is talking. He is Albert Speer, Hitler's architect and later his Minister of Armaments and War Production. He was, by all accounts, one of the most gifted leaders of the Third Reich. And more importantly today, he may be the world's last intimate eyewitness to Adolf Hitler. At the war crimes trial in Nuremberg in 1946, the man who first met Hitler when he was 28 years old and served him with religious fervor for 12 years stood dramatically penitent and told the court and the world 
Who else is to be held responsible for the course of events if not the closest associates around the chief of state? Even in an authoritarian system, Speer said, this collective responsibility of the leaders must exist. There can be no attempting to withdraw from the collective responsibility after the catastrophe. When the verdict of guilty was returned, Albert Speer was sentenced to 20 years in prison, which he was to serve to the final hour. 20 years in Spandau prison in Berlin. 20 years of writing notes on his life within the Nazi hierarchy. Thousands of notes, many of them written on toilet paper. 20 years of walking to keep fit. Speer estimates he walked more than 16,000 miles in the prison courtyard. A rock garden provides diversion. 20 years of incredible determination to survive, to cope. 20 years of self-discipline. 20 years of reflection. 20 years of questioning. How did it happen? Why was he so loyal? Why was he so mesmerized by Adolf Hitler? What of his guilt? What of his children? What of his wife, Margaret? His childhood sweetheart, with whom he fell in love while in high school. He courted her for six years prior to his marriage. This 1925 photo of Speer and his fiancée shows a handsome couple unaware that they were about to be caught up in one of the grimmest horror stories in all of history. In 1966, Speer is released from prison, and Margaret, who has waited faithfully for him, takes him home again. Home is an English-style villa overlooking Heidelberg, Germany, a house built by his architect father near the turn of the century. Speer immediately begins compiling his 25,000 pages of prison notes, and in 1970, his first book, Inside the Third Reich, is published. Another book by Speer, titled Inside Spandau Prison, is to be published next year. In this two-part special edition on Donahue, Speer is questioned about Hitler's relationship with his mistress, Eva Brown. Speer's own claim that he was never an anti-Semite. Speer's assertion that he did not know of Nazi extermination camps until 1944. Speer's own theory on how a Hitler could have happened, and his personal assessment of whether it could happen again. This is part one of Albert Speer, Eyewitness to Hitler, and we hope you'll join us. Before we get going, I have one, one quick question. I, having lived here all my life, there's always been two questions which have pervaded Chautauqua County. One, is Elvis still alive? And two, does Phil Donahue own property in Bemis Point? <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't expect this to be the first question, but I'm happy to answer it. Uh, <laughs> no, we don't, but um, when Marlo and I travel, uh, especially to a golf course area, we discover that we own a home on several golf courses. Uh, realtors float this to, uh, in their own uh, clever way, to suggest we've got celebrities here, so certainly you'll want to live here. Um, I mean, I play golf uh, and heard people say, no, they live over here on the fourth fair. No, they're on the 12th. Uh, so that's just uh, one, one little uh, sidebar being a so-called celebrity. <laughs> By the way, I want to apologize for Marlo's absence. She's, uh, she's uh, engaged in what she calls, uh, she's engaged in fundraising for her father's hospital, uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. She calls it the world's second oldest profession. 
And she says it's just as tiring. I mean, how she know that? Um, but she, uh, and by the way, uh, uh, Marlo grew up as a Beverly Hills brat, and of course, uh, her family and Lucille Ball's family uh, are very tight. She's uh, close to Lucy, so I feel that uh, I'm at home here. And of, of, of the three celebrities here, Jackson, Lucille Ball, and Roger Torrey Peterson, I'm able to claim only, uh, I only had the opportunity to interview one of them, and that was Lucy. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, legitimized here uh, as a guest. No, no question. I don't know how we'll segue back into this, but uh, you, we just saw this extraordinary interview, again, over 30 years ago, not that long after Speer gets out of prison. How did you come up with the idea? This was sort of unique. Well, the Donahue Show in 1975 was really starting to make uh, a lot of noise. And uh, we had a tremendous reputation with the publishing industry. If you wrote a book, your publisher wanted you on the Donahue Show. Remember that uh, you were a guest for an hour, an hour, by yourself. And usually, by the end of that hour, the viewer wanted the book. So we got a very uh, good reputation for being able to sell books. And Macmillan was uh, Speer's publisher. And Macmillan called us, and we said, yeah, we'll go to uh, Heidelberg. And uh, that's how that happened. So this particular book, I think he'd already had the Inside the Third Reich out, so it must have been right. a Spandau book. You obviously spent a lot of time researching about Speer. How, how did, what was your sources of that? Did you, uh, clearly you had an interest. Well, yes, I read the book, of course, and uh, I was impressed. I mean, I was fascinated, as a lot of people before and after my interview were, Albert Speer was, uh, first of all, he was a, a very good-looking 30-something guy. All the pictures, he's, he's very close to matinee idol here. And Frau Margaret is an attractive woman as well, as I know. We dined at Speer's uh, residence in uh, Heidelberg. A weird experience to have dinner with a Nazi. Uh, she prepared the meal. And uh, to answer directly your question, uh, what did I? Uh, who was Speer? Um, you know, he stood, he stepped up and said, you got me. Of all the defendants, he was the most honest. And by the way, when he walked out of Spendau prison after 20 years, Frau Margaret was standing at the gate waiting for him. Uh, so we have here a uh, fascinating personal story, a young man who was taken into the inner circles of power as a very young man. Uh, I always felt Hitler probably wanted to look like Albert Speer. That's one of the... <clears throat> and uh, how could it happen? And uh, I should also say, Speer gave me a piece of toilet paper on which he had written in prison and I can't find it. And so I'm left today to wonder uh, what that might go for on eBay. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of the size of the charitable deduction you would get if you gave it to the Jackson Center. <laughs> <laughs> well, the least I could do. Uh, well, Justice Speaking Jackson of fundraising, yeah. would be, yes, world's second oldest profession, yes. You walk, I mean, literally, you walk in and, and you eyeball a guy who you'd seen on black and white newsreels mm -hmm. to the right-hand side of, of uh, Adolf Hitler. You must have had a chemical reaction. Oh, yes. I mentioned it as one of the moments that I remember uh, most vividly. Um, I was, uh, you know, you suddenly realize you're, you're with a person who knew, intimately knew, was a colleague of um, the most vilified man of the 20th century, if not several other centuries. Um, and it was strange. Um, I was distracted by the St. Bernard, a very unfriendly St. Bernard, 
who obviously didn't like me. So those are just some of the memories that come to me as I re recall the first meeting with him. And I, you know, I couldn't wait to get going. We shot 103 minutes, 106 minutes of film. That's a long time, especially for a man who uh, is, was 70 at the time. And uh, also for a man who English was his second language. Uh, and he, did, he did very well, as you'll see. But still, it was a struggle for him. He, he was clearly very, very tired at about 60 minutes. But we just kept going. And, uh, edited it down to two uh, down in your program. It was a one day shoot? Yes, one afternoon. Did you have to work through agents to kind of get there? Is that what Macmillan uh, said? No, that? no, Macmillan obviously facilitated this. I mean, right. Macmillan definitely wanted this to happen. And I don't think we hurt sales at all. Um, but I mean, the other side of it is, you know, even in 1975, I mean, the, the audience was a lot more interested in male strippers than in Albert Speer. And uh, so I can't say that this program burned the town down in, in, in ratings, but uh, we certainly had our share of uh, viewers and uh, obviously a very thoughtful audience watched it. Do you get a sense of Speer's background, his, his education? Did, did, did that come out as a, clearly he was an architect first and foremost and then ultimately kind of got sucked into a... Uh, Minister of Army. Exactly. And, kind of unintended consequences? I, I didn't, I don't know whether he, um, well, first of all, that he would have been elevated to Minister of Armaments was a tremendous personal, professional victory for Speer. This was a big job. Mm -hmm. And it is the job that got him to Nuremberg because he was using uh, forced labor. Uh, for that uh, undertaking. Uh, but I, uh, I think probably what happened is uh, after he became his Hitler's architect and after the grand designs for Berlin were gone over and, and spread out before the Fuhrer, uh, the war started to go bad. And I think that's when he grabbed Speer and said, get in there and uh, let's kick up this war machine to make sure we have the material uh, to fight it. Do you get any sense what Hitler saw in Speer that would cause him to Velcro to that personality? I, I don't. I mean, I, I, I can only speculate. And that, as I suggested, is I, I found in my own career a lot of powerful men in my own business. I have a younger, uh, not a gopher necessarily, but a, a super kind of assistant. And those assistants are always good looking. And I always felt that powerful men choose men they wish they looked like to work for them. And I think that was the case with Speer and Hitler. Similarly, the grand plan that Hitler had, and it seemed like everything we've read, he had, there was a sense of Fuhrer principle where the Fuhrer would just simply tell Speer some part of it, tell Goering part of it. Did you get a sense from Speer that he only knew part of the Hitler's grand plan? Well, I asked him that, I asked him specifically. I don't know what, what uh, bites are going to use it. I said, how could this be? How can you possibly exterminate six million people and claim not to know about this? And he came right back at me and said, uh, you had several people involved in the Manhattan Project. And no one else in government knew about it. Uh, in, in Germany, you never spoke about things that did not have to do with your room. And I thought, room? And then I realized he means office. So you minded your own business. This was his response. You only concerned yourself with the issues that had to do with your office and you minded your own business and didn't interfere with other people or inquire about what other people were doing. It's a little facile, but not totally unbelievable. Along those same lines, I think in your interview, you, you talked a little bit about when he might have known about when the concentration camps would have existed and, and some of the horrors from that. And it was well down the, the road was, uh, 
Do you get a sense that that was, you, as you, you used the term, uh, legitimate, that he only knew about the concentration camps in 1943 and, and that it was a... I don't know why he would deny knowing about the concentration camps and at the same time be so candid and uh, repentant and honest in his uh, statement at the trial. So I'm left to, uh, it's, the, the secret has gone uh, to the grave with Speer. I, I just, uh, I, there's, there's been big books written, there's a, a book written by uh, a woman who attempts to examine Speer's inner thoughts and what he knew and how culpable is he, you know, how guilty is he and how, how honest was his confession and his plea and so on. And I think she came up with the, I think she suggested that uh, he wasn't honest. I'm not sure why she came to that conclusion because I had no reason to doubt him. He did his 20 years. He said, you got me. He went to prison and he came out. I don't know why he'd lie about all those other things. He had nothing to lose. He'd already been sentenced and his books were an attempt. He knew that he was part of something that history would always be curious about. And he, I think, gave his best effort to tell the world how this could happen. His relationships with some of the other hierarch hierarchical uh, individuals like Goering, did he get into that at all? Do you recall how Goering has some of the characters that were there? He said that uh, he thought that uh, in 1975, Hess was, Hess was still at Spandau. And he thought that uh, Hess should be released. He, he released. He is an old man. Uh, why are they keeping him? And by the way, I think all of the Allied powers uh, were in agreement toward, uh, toward 1975 and shortly thereafter that uh, Hess should be released. And the Russians stood firm and said no. And Hess died in Spandau prison. And immediately after his death, the prison was closed. One of the questions you asked in the introduction was the relationship at the very end with Speer and Hitler and in the bunker, mm -hmm. and a little bit about the whole Evo Braun mm -hmm. story. So I think maybe we'll pause for a second and show a, a clip of your questioning. Did you like Eva Braun? Yes, I liked her. Uh, in my opinion, she was uh, not uh, tempted by all, the, all her power she certainly could have used as a mistress of Hitler. She uh, behaved uh, uh, modest and um, she um, was um, then, in the end, one of the very few who showed some courage. How? She could have uh, stayed away from, from, uh, from Berlin, from the bunker. Even Hitler advised her uh, not to go to Berlin, and um, she could have had afterwards a normal life. I think she would be the most interesting person now for all the interviewers of the world. And um, uh, going to, um, to Berlin with the intention to die with Hitler, for a woman, it's really a courageous uh, deed. You have no doubt that they died together? I have no doubt. I only read the reports, but I have no doubt. And uh, it, to uh, Hitler, when I, was in, when I visited him the last time, he uh, predicted already the way he will die and said also Eva Braun will die with him. What specifically did he say? Did he say this to you? He said it to me. Uh, he didn't... Uh, explain it um, in details how he will do it, but he then said that uh, uh, his body and the body of Eva Braun shall be burned so that the uh, Russian can't uh, misuse them in Moscow. Did you talk with Eva Braun during this final hour? Yes, when I, when I had uh, 
um, a short talk with Hitler and was present with a, a channel, with a military situation uh, a conference, which was uh, some ridiculous thing in this time because there was no more anything to handle and to to order. Um, uh, Eva Braun asked me to come to her in her small private room, and she was very kind. And she said, "You haven't eaten anything, I guess." And she, first of all, like a good housewife, she gave me something to eat, and then she ordered a bottle of champagne, and we drank a bottle of champagne. Just together. the two of you? We two, together, yes. Did she weep? No. No, she, uh, um, astonishing enough, she was the only in this bunker who said to me, why all this nonsense with fighting, that is over. Why do we fight? Eva said, why all the fighting? You mean, uh, why all the fighting now that the war is over? Yes, she thought, why they are fighting now. She didn't mean the war. She meant uh, it's better to go uh, quickly to an end. Did she know she was going to die? Yes. She said that? Yeah, she said it. Why the curiosity in Eva Braun? That continues to this day. Well, the uh, woman sleeping with the monster of our time is a big story. Um, <laughs> and uh, this Speer, uh, after this meeting, I can't remember, it was after or before, took out a picture of the Fuhrer. I think it was, might have been before he went. And he looked at the Fuhrer. And I I bombs were falling. I mean, it, it was the very last gasp of the war. Hitler and Eva Brown and the dog, Bruno, were in the bunker. And Speer, before he went to the bunker, looked at the picture of Hitler and wept. And I always thought it, it was a courageous thing for him to say that. Uh, not only because of, you know, doesn't he speak of manliness as we might have expected him to posture, but um, because it, it acknowledged that he had, he was, tr he was riveted by uh, Hitler. He was mesmerized by him. And he was also a young man who was right there with the Fuhrer, couldn't have been in, it is not unlike a 30-year-old person being swept up by the President of the United States. Uh, so, uh, I, and then he goes to the bunker. He said, I said, did, he, did you shake hands with him? He said, yes. He said, it was a limp handshake. And I was also, I also recall him saying that, and Eva was saying, uh, why are they still fighting? It is over. Um, and then apparently it was shortly after that, he took his leave and uh, the suicide ensued, uh, as, w as well as the death of the dog. The dog was euthanized on the, at that moment. Was a little time before he actually ended up in the bunker with Hitler on the last days, he really was part of a plan to assassinate him. Yes, um, he was. And uh, it's a plan, obviously, that, that, that did not materialize. There were more than one attempts at uh, assassination. And uh, he acknowledged that uh, he had been a part of that, and, uh, uh, and it was uh, unsuccessful. Now, obviously, when he weeps at seeing the photograph, and when he goes to the bunker and he meets him and shakes his hand, it's hard to believe that he would engage in that kind of uh, cabal, but he apparently did. Did you get a sense that Speer was anti-Semite? Well, I pursued this uh, pretty rigorously. And here is my own take on it, for what it's worth. Uh, he claims adamantly not to have been an anti-Semite. Well, how do, then can he explain? What, what was it with the Jews? And then he immediately goes from, I am not an anti-Semite, to the Jews would own in Berlin the dancing bars. Dancing bars. And came very close to saying that the Jews, the problem that the Jews had is that they were perceived 
as making money at a time when the populace was suffering. So what you got were the old canards of uh, anti-Semitism coming from the man who had just said, I'm not an anti-Semite. So in some sense, you know, uh, racism is, is a lot like cancer. You don't always know you have it. And I think in some ways, uh, Speer was an anti-Semite who didn't know it, who didn't fully appreciate the venomous uh, nature of uh, his own feelings and what it could lead to. Uh, and then throw in a little denial, and I think you've got the makings of a, uh, of a person who quite obviously had negative uh, attitudes about Jews that he was not able to surface and, and uh, speak honestly about. In your conversation with Speer and Speer's sense of Hitler, was there a real sense of world domination and potentially oh. the uh, attack on America? Uh, I said to him, uh, he talks in his book about Hitler's going to take this country and then that country. They talked about this. And I said, when he was saying, we'll take Poland and then, you know, we'll move. Uh, on and we'll take Russia. I said, didn't, didn't you say, ever wonder to yourself, this guy is wacky? And he looked at me and he said, if you saw and were there and realized the successes that he was having, it was not at that moment a totally unthinkable possibility that the Third Reich would have expanded its power to these vast regions of the globe. That obviously was something that everybody near uh, Hitler believed would happen. They saw it as very possible. I, in fact, we could assume that significant numbers of them didn't question the fact that it was going to happen. Master race, German people, Hitler our leader, uh, on and on, and of course, uh, I, shortly. I mean, this is the, this is the. These are the ingredients that led to the horrible campaign in Russia and the deaths of millions and millions of people. I think at one point during your interview, Speer allowed us how there was a, a Messerschmitt that they were attempting to create, which would in fact have a payload that we could leave literally Germany and end up in, a, in America. Uh, it was just a remarkable revelation. I, I wasn't aware of that, but he, he yeah. didn't disclose that. Oh, yeah. The vision was high, and uh, they felt realistic. It wasn't pie in the sky. Nobody was, uh, nobody was talking through their hat. Uh, this was a mission they were on. You know, it, it's, uh, it's something we know, and that is that uh, power corrupts, and it's, it's just a, a fascinating study of how power and a few successes make people think. You know, like, we can do this. Let's go. At one point during your interview, and we're going to watch it now, it's a you try to recap and, and reconcile a little bit about Speer's disparate views, the anti-Semitism on one hand, the uh, the lack, lack of recognition, the anti-Semitism, yet his actions would belie that, et, et cetera. So maybe we can show that clip, Ed. Let's just review the chronology, Herr Speer, mm -hmm. not to badger you, but to try to understand. Your story is that you grew up in Germany in the 20s and 30s without any feeling of any anger or resentment toward Jews. Mm -hmm. you, you existed in power in the Third Reich for 12 years without knowing with uh, the specifics or without directly having any knowledge at all of the mass extermination of millions of people. You went to see Hitler at considerable personal risk after it was over. As we would say in America, the ball game was over. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, you left Berlin 
you took a picture of Hitler, you found a portrait of Hitler, you looked at it, and you wept. That's it's true. And then several months later, a short time later, you stood up at Nuremberg and you said, I am guilty. Do you understand how difficult it is to absorb the juxtaposition of all these events? It, it makes it difficult for many, I think, mm -hmm. to understand your sincerity and wonder rather about your opportunism. If I would have uh, handled the things in an opportunistic way, I would have left out many things of my uh, narrative of my life uh, in the first book. I, it was not necessary that I, in all lengths, I am explaining how it was with Hitler those last days. And, um, but I, I wanted, it was a purpose behind it. Uh, I wanted to show that in spite of everything, uh, the charisma of Hitler, which is unexplainable, uh, was still active in me, that I was torn between two poles. Uh, one side was, you know, uh, that Hitler, a uh, few weeks before, was trying to make a scorched earth policy in Germany, and he gave strict orders, and I felt uh, that I have to risk something to uh, con to make counter orders uh, against this policy. Uh, so I was, with, a rational, with my rational feelings, I was on a, on, a, on a good track, but with my emotional feelings, I was still bound to Hitler. I can't change it. It, it was that way. Mm -hmm. But then uh, after, after, not only in Nuremberg, after um, I was in this so-called Dönitz government for a few weeks, I already wrote to uh, uh, Dönitz in a letter that it's now up to the leading people to take the guilt on their shoulders. You first heard, you first saw Hitler in 1930, 31. 31. And you heard him, you were not political before you went to this speech. And then you went to the speech and you were instantly converted. Yeah to Hitler. Yes. One speech. Mm -hmm. So fast. Yeah. How? How is that possible? Yeah. I ask myself too, but uh, uh, you know that um, there are in history other persons too who have a big influence uh, in, by their speeches or by their appearances. Uh, I think uh, Stalin was a man like it, like it. Napoleon was somebody who had it's an influence on it. Any contemporaries I, you can think of? Well, I would say the, the, the way Kennedy succeeded in Germany when he was here was a similar thing, that he was just so convincing and his personality was so, was so strong that um, he conquered the German people. Uh, Eek, I mean, Berliner? Eek. Not only that, but his, whole, his whole, whole appearance was, I think, very convincing. You quote Hitler as saying, the Jews, Hitler speaking, the Jews made me go into politics. How? Uh, that was one day in, uh, on the Obersalzberg uh, during the crisis of Stalingrad, and Hitler asked me to go with him on a stroll down the mountain slide to the so-called tea house. And <laughs> before he um, asked the other persons around him to stay away. And uh, this, um, during this half hour or three quarters of an hour walking in the snow, he um, showed some of his inner, um, of his feelings and of, his, um, of the way he was, uh, he was feeling about his life. And uh, he told me that he was always aiming to be a, an architect, to be a great architect, and that the Jewish were spoiling this by um, making the November Revolution. He gave the whole 
responsibility or culp culpability to the Jewish who already had organized in his eyes the strike of ammunition production. Uh, and um, in, in what year was this, Herr Speer? That was 1917, and um, which were organizing the revolution. And in this day, he blandly uh, said that the Jewish people who are uh, uh, changed my whole fate. I never wanted to be a politician. I wanted to be an architect. They changed his whole fate because they struck? They went on strike? No, They're because mainly the strike and uh, the organization of the revolution in Hitler's eyes uh -huh. only was, uh, was a Jewish uh, deed. And contributed to Germany's defeat? And they were responsible for the defeat. He held the Jews accountable for the defeat of Germany yes. in World War I. Yes. Do you get a sense that that was Speer's thinking also? Yeah, it's hard for me to say. I mean, um, that's what makes you know, prejudice and racism so insidious. You insult me if you say I am. How can you look into my soul? Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure I can say. I, I don't, uh, I do know that Albert Speer was raised in an anti-Semitic environment, and it is not possible for him to have escaped the, uh, the demons uh, of, and the conversation of adults around him, and the whole notion of Jews as succeeding on the backs of uh, poor people and exploiting uh, situations uh, at a low economy for their own financial benefit. All these, all these uh, charges, which have, you know, have been so consequential to 20th century history, uh, are there. And we see the living presence of this at a time when uh, these attitudes and feelings led to the biggest atrocity of my lifetime. So I'm not about to present myself as knowing what, who knew what, when, and what they felt, and how, you know, how, how venal they were. Some obviously were more venal than others. Uh, let's also remember that Speer was, was hugely ambitious. So that it's very, you know, it, pursuing that profession and finding himself in the same spotlight as the Fuhrer uh, probably allowed him to overlook a lot, a mm -hmm. lot of things that a Catholic altar boy, we hope, wouldn't. Well, as a Catholic altar boy, shaking the hands of uh, uh, Albert Speer, whose political ideology would be not necessarily consistent, did, did, did that cross your mind at all? I mean, the relationship between the Nazis, the, the, the Pope, uh, did, did that ever... That came later to yeah. me. Yeah. That came later. A lot of things came late to me <laughs> in life. Uh, I remember interviewing Noam Chomsky, and I said, what are you trying to say? And he said, never, ever trust the state. And for, and it, it was around, certainly after this interview. You know, and for a Catholic graduate of the University of Notre Dame, proud American. That was a, that was a blow. What do you mean, never trust the state? Uh, we were, you know, we were raised, Marlowe's parents used to say if they didn't know what they were doing, they wouldn't be in Washington. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and my parents said this. Um, we were raised to, you know, America defeated the uh, Nazi menace, the uh, def in, in, in victory in the, in the Pacific over Japan. We were in lend-lease. We were good in all things. Um, Eisenhower, my goodness, I was so grateful to be an American. And then to have somebody say, never, ever trust the state. And it, 
you know, this awareness of what power does and how the, how the state, anybody who's dealt with the IRS knows what it means. Don't, you know, power, they're, they're the IRS and you're not, you know? Um, it's, um, it was a big revelation to me. And uh, as I say, much later in life did I come to appreciate the importance of dissent, uh, that there is no democracy without dissent, there was no dissent in Germany. Uh, whatever, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and who? And we all know the fate that those uh, brave people met. So uh, this was kind of the beginning of the evolution of Phil Donahue's political uh, thinking. And it was very painful. Um, you know, nobody told me we were going to lose a war when I graduated from Notre Dame. Nobody told me. They would shoot my president. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, it was a shock. And I think, I, I think what I'm suggesting here is, uh, is commentary that could be offered by lots of people my age. Uh, we came from just the most wonderful patriotic victory, all good in all things nation, to suddenly uh, uh, watching the cops beat up the kids in 1968 in Chicago. So uh, this was, along the way, one of the milestones of my education. Though you said you weren't badgering him, did you find during the course of the interview that he would reel from some of your questioning? Or was he really, as a depicted, sort of uh, uh, listening attentively in, in response? Uh, I, I don't think I threw him back at all. Yeah. I don't. I think uh, every, you know, and I was trying to be, it's a very difficult thing. You're in a man's house, you know, and you say, oh, you know, you, it's, it's a little, and also, who do I think I am, you know? And he tried to, uh, he, I think he, I honestly believe he tried to tell the truth. I don't think he had any reason not to. And along the way, as with all of us, I guess we can say, there are some holes there in, in, this, in some of his testimonies that will be forever questioned and that do, will always raise eyebrows. Towards the end, in fact, we'll, we'll probably show this as part of the this end of this part of the uh, of our show here, that you get him into a really reflexive mode and then you actually conclude with a little bit of a, uh, get your own conclusion. So maybe we can show that, Ed, if we could. <laughs> 